Please open up your bulletins to the section marked Sermon. We've got the words there from John 15. I'll take you through them this morning. Then we will pray. I will pray. And try and help you and myself as well understand these words better. John chapter 15. Jesus' words that come to his disciples, to his followers, to us, on a night that was probably one of his most challenging nights ever because the very next day was the day that he was crucified on a, on a cross, put to death on a cross. And ha- as he was in the upper room with his disciples, he wanted them to know what he was preparing them for because they had no idea of their future, no idea. But he wanted them to be ready. So he gave them this, these words and he's giving us these words. He says... I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, live in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides or lives in the vine, Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish. And it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. This is the word of our Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, dear Heavenly Father, please use this time this morning to help us understand our purpose and how we come to know and experience our purpose in life. Let your Holy Spirit fill this place today and not just this building but our hearts. Let your word penetrate and cleanse us. Dedicate this time to raising up our hearts and our lives to God who gave everything to bring us into his presence, creating us to have the drive and the power to bear fruit. So may that happen this morning, dear Lord. It cannot happen unless we are connected to you. It cannot happen unless you are working in us. We need you. Abide with us. Live in us. Amen. A little review for those of you who have gone through this series, and, and even if you haven't, maybe this will help you understand what it means to be a follower of Christ, what it means to be a disciple of Christ. We spoke about at the very beginning of this that being a Christian and being a disciple are really two different things. They're they're somewhat connected, but there are some differences too. The main difference comes in the first thing that we learned about being a disciple. I'm going to have to have you forward it, Kevin. For some reason it's not working. First one is, a disciple lives in the Word. And, and without going into much description, it's that idea of abiding in, living inside of, meaning the word will protect you, the word will cover you, it will shelter you, it will give you freedom. The next slide. A disciple invests in another disciple. Uh, this was brought out with the terms love one another, bear with one another, be patient with one another, and 31 other descriptions of how we are to work with one another not just in the large group that we see here this morning, but in smaller groups, getting to know each other, rubbing each other raw, and yet forgiving one another. That's what it means when a disciple invests in another disciple. Then we have the next, next part of being a disciple. We talked about last week, a disciple gives. A disciple has a heart where he wants to give to something to see a change, a change in the local church, a change in the community. He, a disciple is a giving individual. And then the one we'll focus on this week, a disciple bears fruit. 
two sayings that I'm going to use to get us going on this thought. One is from Mark Twain. Mark Twain said, the two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. The day you're born, your birthday, we all love celebrating, well, most of us love celebrating birthdays. But maybe some of you have found what your purpose is in life and you found out why you are here. Why do I exist? And, and it's a wonderful feeling to know this is why God created me. But it's paradoxically equally challenging if you don't know why am I here? Or if you've had someone say to you, you're, you're worthless, you're not worth anything, you have no purpose, you have no value. And it's hard to fight against those thoughts if someone has said that to you in their actions or in their words. Because every one of us needs to know that we are created for a purpose. And God lays that out today in the terms, you are to bear fruit. That's a part of what our purpose is. That's the first saying. The next one, I don't know if I, I did have it on there. The brain is a wonderful organ. It starts the moment you get up and it doesn't stop until you get into the office. Here's the challenge. The challenge is, when we wake up in the morning, our brain is just going a million miles an hour. We think of all those things that we need to accomplish, and, and we think of things we're afraid of. Our brain is very active, but when we get to that place of productivity, it's almost like we get stifled. We get afraid. We stop. How do we overcome that? In our text today from John 15, Jesus lays out how we can be more productive in our life, how we can take away that fear of trying and go with it. Go at life with gusto. Be, be individuals who are excited about the next day, not knowing what the next day will bring, but excited because we know that God has created us for something today and tomorrow and every day we exist on this earth. So let's go find out what this is. Why am I here? Jesus starts us out by saying in verse 1, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He lays out again another, last week we had a, a picture of a farmer sowing his seed and, and we are to be sowing our seed, giving, and it, it'll come back in a harvest. Well, this is a, a farm-related topic today as well, but it deals with vines. It deals with us being connected to the great vine, Jesus. And it, it, it says that the Father is the gardener, the vine dresser, the owner of the vineyard. Now this shows us something that's very wonderful. Uh, Jesus says, I am the true vine. Well, what does that mean? It means that he's got something special for us to do because we are connected to him. But it does not say that he is the one that bears fruit. Please note that. It's easy for us to think, well, Jesus is the one that's supposed to get the good stuff done. No, he's not. Jesus is the vine. You and I are the branches connected to the vine as Christians. And as Christians, we are the ones that are to be productive. And it's a connection with him. There's a man by the name of Robbie. He's from the Far East. He grew up in a, a very shame-based culture. And in his family, he was one of five children. In, in the shame-based culture, you motivate children to do things by saying, if you don't, you will disgrace your family. That's a shame-based culture. Some of our families, we grew up like that. But the Western, Western mindset is slightly different. We have a way of shaming people in different ways. But in this Eastern shame-based culture, what your parents think of you is based on your productivity. And of all of the five kids in Robbie's family, his father looked at him and was most distressed with him. And one day, his mother said, his mother gave a description of what it was like to be the mother of Ravi, and she said, 
He's, he's a child like this where he travels the world and he goes to endless places. His location is unknown until the dinner bell rings and there he is at the table. He is a child that could be doing anything in any different area and I don't know what he is doing and I don't know what he's producing, but as soon as I ring the dinner bell, he's there to eat. She saw him as unproductive and so did his father. His father very accomplished in government, a very high level in the Indian government, expected much from each of his children, and one day in a very serious manner said this to Ravi, you of all our children will be the greatest disgrace to our family. You will bring the greatest shame to our family. And some of you have never heard those specific words, but you, you know the weight of those words. Maybe a teacher in school said something like that. It's like, you're no good. You're not capable of anything. Maybe it was a father or a mother. Maybe it was a sister or a brother. Maybe it was a neighborhood kid. Maybe it was somebody that rode on the bus with you that just looked down on you and just assumed you'd never amount to anything. You feel the weight of those words. You feel like there's no possible way I can be productive. Some of you feel the weight of those words today because of your age. You've progressed past the Western mindset of productivity, which I suppose ends right about 50, which means my life is almost over. And you think that being old means now unproductive. Some of us feel the weight of those words because we're so young. We can't yet drive a car or get a job, but we feel unproductive. Some of us feel that way because our, our jobs are difficult and we're not getting anywhere in them. Or maybe we don't even have a job yet. And we feel unproductive. Ravi, when he heard those words from his father, they sunk so deep into his heart. They drove him down so far and at just barely 17, those words caused him to decide, I need to leave this world. I'm done. Thankfully, in our, our way of believing as Christians, almost every one of us has been taught to take your own life is not a God-pleasing thing because only God has the right to take life away. And yet, have you ever in your life had one of those days where you felt so unproductive, so worthless, that maybe you weren't going to take your life, but boy, you kind of wished you could speed it up? And you hoped that the chaos of traffic on that particular Monday might just cut your life short and give you a ticket off this planet? Or maybe in, in the midst of a sickness or an illness, you wished that God would finish it out and you would be done because you feel unproductive. When Ravi reached that low, he wanted to take his life. And at 17, he ended up flat on his back in a hospital bed barely alive, so down, only one person can bring him up. And this is what our text says. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. We've grown up our whole lives hearing those phrases, and, and here's what it probably sounds like in your Christian mind. He cuts off every branch that bears no fruit. If I'm not bearing fruit, God's going to hack me off and throw me away. Now, is there ever a truth to that? Yes. There is a point where God says, I, I've tried and I've tried and I've worked in you and I've worked in you. And, and he, it, later on in the text, in verse 7, he says, yes, there is a cutting off part. But that's not what it says here. Please forward it. Um, I think it's the next slide. Well, let's, let's talk about this first. As a Christian, 
Verse 8 is one of our most important verses. It says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Again, this is not Jesus bearing fruit. This is you. This, is, this means that the Father, as the vine dresser, has a very important role. And in that metaphor, he has nothing else of value other than to see you bear fruit, to see you productive, to see you accomplish something. That's his main goal in life, according to, to this illustration. Nothing else matters to him except that in you, the, the power of the vine is pulsing through you and good fruit comes out of you. That's his every ambition. He wakes up in the morning if God even goes to sleep. He wakes up in the morning looking to see what is being grown from you. Productivity. Then go to the next slide. One more. These words scare us. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes. One more slide. Here is what the Greek implies very strongly. Two changes that I would encourage you to make in your Bibles at home. And take it for what it's worth, but they're very valuable. And you can look this up on the internet and you can find the words yourself. I would be happy to give you direction, but the word means to lift up. And it's a vineyard term. And the word to, to prune actually means he cleans. Here's what it means in the description of a vine. A vine that's growing down on the ground in the weeds, covered by grass and bushes, is a vine that maybe can bear fruit, but it gets very little sunlight. The leaves get very little sunlight, so it, it doesn't have enough of the nutrients. The, the photosynthesis hasn't reached the plant, and together with the vine's nutrients, there it will have the ability to bear fruit, but not on the ground. What happens if you're down, down on the ground as a vine or a branch? That's where the dust gets on you. And the dust, if you do bear fruit, the dust turns into mildew. Or if you do start to bear fruit, somebody tramples on you, somebody squashes your fruit. But more than likely, there won't be any fruit if you're hanging down in the ground and the grass. So the first word says, he lifts you up. God came to Ravi when he was so far down, so feeling worthless. And through a young Christian man who brought him a Bible and a Christian mother who opened up that Bible to John 11, Ravi got lifted up and found out that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Whoever lives in him, whoever's connected to him is going to have life. God lifted him up. Some of you today need to know that you don't belong in the dirt. God is lifting you up. God is resurrecting you. He is pulling your life out of the dust because you cannot be productive down here. You cannot be productive if you think I'm worthless. I'm no good. And he lifts you up. And at 17 on a bed of suicide... Ravi brought a man into his life who delivered that Bible, a mother who read to him the words of life because the gardener had already planned, planted or planned in Ravi's life to lift him up. And God is doing the same through you too. Somehow in your life today, this week, God is going to lift you up. It's not your job to pick yourself up by the bootstraps. It's the gardener's job. Look for it. Wait for it. Pray for it. Ask for it. He's going to lift you up. But not only if the, the grapes are down on the ground or if the branches are on the ground, will they not be productive, not bear fruit, or not very good fruit? They have to be lifted up, put on a trellis, and then cleaned. Again, this is the job of the gardener. Because fruit that, that does start to bear fruit, unfortunately, the, the, that culture at that time, very dusty, very dry. And dust would fill the air, and little swirls and winds would pick up dust, and, and, and birds would fly overhead. The grapes get dirty. Dirty grapes are not productive grapes. 
Dirty grapes are damaged grapes, mildewed grapes. And the vine dresser continually washes the grapes. In some parts of the world, they even put protection around the grapes today to keep them clean. It is the job of the gardener to lift you up and say, you have potential. You will do great things if you're connected to the vine. And it's the gardener's job to clean you off. Ravi learned on that bed of suicide that he had been cleaned. He started to believe in something more than himself and started to see that Jesus had, had lived so that he could die for Ravi. And that through his death, he would give Ravi life. And through his death, he gives every one of us the potential of life, real life. And he lifted him up and he made him productive. The problem is, as Christians, we see filth in our life and we panic. I know the thoughts that run through some of your minds. You see your sinful hearts and you freak out. What is a thought like this doing in a Christian mind? And you're convinced, I can't go back to church until I clean this up. I'm not going to be a good member of this Christian community until I make all these mistakes disappear. You are not the vine dresser. The Father is. The Father is the one who cleans. Go back to the Father and confess your sins to him. Confess your failings to him. But let him do the cleaning and let him pronounce to you the words of forgiveness. You're forgiven. Verse 3 says, you are forgiven. You are clean because of the word that has been spoken to your heart. It's the word that came to every one of us in baptism if we were baptized. It said, you're my child, a precious son, a precious daughter of the Father. It's the words that come to us every Sunday. It says, you are forgiven. By the sacrifice of Jesus, you are forgiven. By his death on the cross, you are forgiven. It's the words that we will hear from the front of church today. That you're connected to Jesus and, and because of that connection with the perfect life of Jesus and his innocent death, forgiveness is now a part of you. Do you live sensing that you are clean? Or are you confused by the dirt and the filth that is there? There will be both. Because I am a sinner who is daily being washed clean. And so are you. Ravi, this young man who took his life, tried to take his life, almost 50 years ago now, God lifted him up. God the Father washed him clean. And much later in life, Robbie had the opportunity to bring his father, the one who despised his productivity, to bring his father back into his life. And his father, just a few years ago, almost 10, 15 years ago, was at a university, a very prestigious university, where Robbie was receiving an honorary doctorate for all the work that he has now done, all the productivity that has taken place in his life. Because you see, the name of Ravi, his last name is Zacharias. He is the leader of an organization called RZIM, Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. It's probably one of the greatest Christian apologetic groups in the world. And it got put together by a man who was in the dirt, down, convinced there was no productivity in him. God lifted him up God washed him off and he bore fruit. Where are you in your life today? Some of you are still wondering, why am I here? Some of you are saying to God, I give up. Some of you haven't even crossed the 15-year-old mark and you're saying, I give up. You 
you. The Father has invested so much in you. He's grafted you into the vine of Christ. You are connected to him. He's lifting you up out of the dirt, out of the dust, and he's continually cleaning you off because he has something good that he is going to do in you. I don't know if you'll be another Ravi Zacharias. It doesn't matter. Maybe you'll be that one person in another individual's life who says to them, I care. And that will turn their whole life around. All I know is God is producing fruit today. Through the word that has been delivered to you, he is going to produce fruit. He has lifted you up and he has cleaned you off and there is something you're going to do and it's going to be wonderful and, and someday in eternity we're all going to look back and go, wow, I had no idea. I had no idea. The man who delivered the Bible into Ravi Zacharias' hospital room he was convinced that his life was worthless. Today, Ravi goes back to him and says, thank you for what you did 50 years ago to lift me up and turn me around. May the Father convince you that's what he will do in you today. Let's pray. As human beings, Lord, we continually analyze our productivity. Are we producing enough? Are we working hard enough? Are we, are we sustaining our families? Are we building them up the way we're supposed to? Are we doing the things we're supposed to do at work, at home, in our neighborhoods? We're continually asking that question. Is it worth being here? Your answer screaming from heaven. Your answer is yes. And you've connected us to Jesus the vine so that we could be productive. Lord, keep our attention focused on him, not our own unpro unproductivity, not our own mistakes, but remind us that we have been lifted up and we have been cleaned. And now we are ready to bear fruit because we're connected to Jesus. Work in us, Lord. Let your spirit fill us and, and convince us and move us in that right direction for the glory of of the Heavenly Father's name, we pray. Amen. I would encourage you, if you have any more questions about this particular sermon today, please write them down. You can write them down um, on this sheet in one of these red books, if you like. Or you can talk to me afterwards. You can send me an email. My email is in the bulletin. Um, if you have questions, please ask me about it. I'd love to share more information with you. At this time, our ushers will be coming around to collect thank offerings. This is for members only, so if you're not a member, please do not feel obligated. But what I would like each of you to do is to take that little red booklet and put your name and number and contact information in there. Thank you.